He puts his arms to his side and I am staring down the double barrels of a sawn off shotgun, which is about six inches a foot away from my nose. Am I right in thinking you found Scotland's most wanted man? Mm. James Alexander Bagry. We're going back many years now. Right. Was a man convicted of murder. He uh, burgled a, a pub, robbed a pub, actually, after closing time, and stuck a sawn-off shotgun at the base of the uh, publican's back, the bottom of his back, and pulled both triggers, gave him both barrels, virtually cut this poor man in half. What? Um, and what Bakery did, apparently, was he broke his own arm in order to have a plaster cast put on, one of those old-type casts, um, in which I think he then concealed some sort of implement which enabled him to break out of the prison. And it was a very audacious kind of plot. He, you know, went across the roofs and all of that and, and clearly had put some considerable thought into escaping from that jail and consequently became known as Scotland's most wanted man. There was a lot of publicity for him up in Scotland. I actually hadn't heard of him down in London. Mm. So I'm in the CID office at Kensington one afternoon and I hear a colleague of mine on the phone and I'm very interested at the one end of the conversation that I can hear. Um, now, this colleague was a competent detective but it just sounded like I ought to pay a bit of attention here, see if I can give him some help. It turned out that Police Scotland, in their efforts to find Bagri, had searched the home of his best mate and they'd ripped this place asunder. You know, floorboards up, chipping down walls if there was any sign of disturbance, all that kind of thing. They took the gaff apart. And they found nothing apart from one scrap of paper with a London telephone number on it. It was the only thing out of this very, very thorough search that they couldn't sort of bottom out. What they'd done is a subscriber check on that telephone number. In other words, to find the address that it related to. It was a landline. Remember back in the day when people had landlines, yeah. everybody? <laughs> and it turned out that it related to a large building in Phil Beach Gardens, Earl's Court, which was on our patch, uh, which was divided up into flats. Glorious old sort of Georgian or Edwardian building, which uh, had a, now housed lots of, it was a, what we'd now call an HMO, you know, a house of multiple occupancy, mm -hmm. lots and lots of flats. So when my mates finished the phone call, I said, what's it all about? And he explained it to me. And he said, I'm going to go and speak to the landlord and ask him, about his tenants and see if he's there. I said, don't do that. I said, whatever you do, don't go and tell the landlord what's going on. What if the landlord is in cahoots with Mr. Bagri, for example? You know, we don't want to tip him the wink. So I said, what we'll do tomorrow morning, we know which flat in this building that number relates to. Me and somebody else will book out guns. I was an authorised firearms officer, so I could book a gun out. I said, a couple of us will book out guns and we'll go there, crack a dawn, smash the door in and see if he's there. Okay, we've got a plan. So we get a team together, you know, six or eight of us. And the following morning, first thing, me and uh, a detective sergeant, we're the two of us, uh, what we'd call shots, we're the, the two with the guns, um, tiptoe up to this flat kick the door in and in the flat there are two single beds but only one of them is occupied and the young man that is in that bed was woken up that morning by me standing about three feet away from him right shouting our oh, police you know don't move blah 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 <coughs> so this young man we he got out of bed and dressed under our instruction and all that kind of thing he was then handcuffed so i stuck my gun away and I did my usual. I'm having a nosy around the around the flat. And on this mantelpiece, um, I can see a photograph. Now, I've got a photograph of Bagri, the mugshot taken when he was arrested. And I'm trying to compare it to this photograph that's on the mantelpiece. And it was very difficult to be authoritative about whether this these two pictures were of the same person. Mm. I couldn't really tell. You know, we are talking about a long time ago and the clarity in photographs that were, you know, just taken by yourselves mm. were, weren't, weren't great. Yeah. 
So what I did when the, 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 the fella who'd been in the other bed wasn't looking, I pocketed that photograph because my intention then was to get it straight to Heathrow Airport, fly up to Scotland and get the Scottish police to look at it, which would give us a bit of a clue as to whether that was bakery or not and so whether we were in the right flat and, you know, we had some kind of direction to take the investigation. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that guy said to my colleagues that his mate who would have stayed in the other bed had gone out for a few beers. He often stayed out. He was a good man. His name was such and such, not James Alexander Bagry. Mm. Um, and they seemed to be fairly happy with his explanation. Um, I was all set to get to the airport, get that picture up there. And, um, and so we left. Left him to it. Undid the handcuffs. Left him to it. Walked downstairs. Now, I had heard the previous day that there was some suggestion that Bagry worked as a builder. So while my mates are all gathered outside discussing the really important business of the day, which is where shall we go and get breakfast, right? I'm looking up and down the road because I was, just, you know, I was born nosy as a detective. You know, you have to be inquisitive if you're going to be a good detective. Mm -hmm. It's what fuels you. It's, it's what you do, finding things out. Mm -hmm. That's your job. Mm -hmm. And over the road, I see a white van. And to me, that looks every inch a builder's van. So what do I do? I go over to it. I'm on my own. The others are on the pavement having a natter. A couple of them are already cleared off, including the, the sergeant who had the other gun. He's already gone. Fair enough. You know, they thought the job was done. And I'm looking and I'm checking. We used to have tax discs, an old disc that sat in the windscreen yeah. back in those days. So I'm checking that. And I can see it is actually a builder's van because behind the driver and passenger seats, there's a partition with a small window in it. So I, and I can't really see through there. So the front of it seems okay. I go around to the back of the van and there's two windows on the back and I look through those, can't really get to see anything clearly at all. Um, and as you do, I chanced my arm, put my hand on the door handle, lo and behold, it opens. So what am I gonna do? Get in the van, of course, right? <laughs> So I start clambering in and I've got kind of like my upper part of the body, you know, one leg up ready to get in. And then all of a sudden from underneath all this junk and rubble and blankets pops a head, right? It pops up. Well, I'm completely and utterly kind of surprised by this. Were you scared by that? So much so at the point. No, I actually went and I got ribbed something rotten about this. Yeah. I went, good morning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Followed by as my hand goes inside my jacket to my shoulder holster, as I'm trying to get my gun out, good morning, I'm an armed police officer. Because instantly I know what's going on here. You know what I mean? It's pretty obvious. But before I could get my gun out, this head, which of course was Baker's, suddenly he puts his arms to his side and I am staring down the double barrels of a sawn-off shotgun, which is about six inches a foot away from my nose. And I haven't got time to try to see who's quickest on the draw here because I know he is. I've not been able to get my handgun out of my shoulder holster in time. So with that, in the finest traditions of the Metropolitan Police, I legged it. <laughs> I, I legged it like I have never run before. I bet. But of course, I'm shouting to my mates, you know, he's got an effing gun. He's got a gun. Leg it. Leg it. But of course, all the time, I've got so much going through my head now, right? The last thing I want him to do is come out of that van on a rampage, on a murderous rampage, and perhaps harm my colleagues or innocent members of the public. But of course, I don't want to get shot either. So I actually ran down past the front of the van because he's in a compartment, you know, he's a compartment at the back. So he's to, to come after me, he's got to come out and show himself. Yeah. And that will then give me a chance of taking a shot at him. I've gone about four or five cars down, dived down, got some cover behind the engine block, so by the front of the car, you know, because if you start shooting, that's the best bit of cover you can get in a car. Is it? Because that's the bit that a bullet is least likely to pass through because right. the engine block is solid metal. Yeah. So I've gone past the front of the car, I've dived down, I've, uh, yeah, get an engine block, there's much of the car between him and me. And this is in Earl's uh, Court, right? This is in Earl's Court, in a residential road, um... And it's now probably about half six in the morning. So the world is beginning to wake up. But I, of course, now have to shout at my very loudest to Bakery, you are surrounded by armed police. He wasn't. My colleague had gone off for breakfast. Yeah, yeah, and it was only me, right? Um, 
you are surrounded by armed police. Put the weapon down. Come out of the van with your hands on your head. There is no way you can escape. You are surrounded. He wasn't, right? I was just winging it. Yeah. My mate, who was my DS or DI at the time, who was in the group chatting about where to go for breakfast, in his haste to run, one of his shoes has come off, right? So he's dived, dived down next to me by the car. Fortunately, people are now getting on the phone, you know, because we've, we've got quite a situation going on here. And I am very much focused on potentially having to kill Bagri if he comes out all guns blazing. Anyway, it was cold and I seemed to be there for an eternity, an absolute eternity. It was so cold that I was swapping my gun from one hand to the other hand. Fortunately, as a firearms officer, you get trained to shoot with both hands. You know, you've got one hand that's better than the other, but I still fancied myself because I took my training very, very seriously. And on that note about training, it was training that saved my life that day because it was drilled into you. Whenever you pull that weapon, you tell people you're armed police. And that morning, you know, when I said good morning, the next best, the next thing that come out of my mouth was that training. I'm an armed police officer. You know, if I hadn't said that and just legged it, he wouldn't have known whether I was armed or not, perhaps, until I'd got down behind the car and started shouting. Mm. So after the good morning, that's the first thing he heard and it's gone in his head. So it was very good for me. I think it quite possibly, yeah. you know, might have kept me and other people alive that day. So swap it from hand to hand. People are calling colleagues and all that kind of stuff. And eventually, I think, after about 30 or 40 minutes of laying in, in, in the gutter with my gun pointed there, and, of course, I could see Bagri moving around in the back of the van because there was that partition window between the front and the back. You know, And every time I see him moving, I'm going, right, brace yourself, Blex. This is when he's going to come out. You know, you better not miss here, son. Um, unfortunately, a woman came down, down the road, and she's walking towards me. And, of course, I kept stony quiet because I just wanted to walk straight past me, you know, just walk past. So she comes and she's almost past me. She's approaching me, approaching me, approaching me, approaching me. She gets level, looks down, sees me, a man, you know, in jeans and a bomber jacket with a gun, and she's utterly paralysed by fear and by what she's seen. I'm saying, madam, 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 just move on, move on, move on. I'm police, move, move. Move, and she won't. So in the end, I just levelled my gun at her. I said, move. <laughs> and then she did. It kind, of, it kind of snapped her out of her paralysis, yeah, you know? Yeah. But of course, I didn't want to take my gun off a bakery. I pointed at her, but I had to. Yeah. You know, it was for her safety. Please, madam. Yeah. Leg it. Yeah. Um, move shit with an E. If you don't. Come on. <laughs> like in the movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it was pretty tense. Um, eventually... The firearms branch came down and they sealed the area off. And of course, they had marksmen on the roof and it became a, a siege. And mm. it was it was top item on the news. It paralysed the traffic in that part of West London for a couple of days. Wow. And then on the second night, um, I was at a do, a CID do in Kensington. The siege was still going on. Of course, they were negotiating with him, trying to get him to surrender. Oh, it was lasted that long, is it, the siege? Just yeah, I think up. it went on for about... 36 hours, wow. something like that, a bit longer maybe. Why didn't he come out? Because he's worried of getting shot, yeah? But there's no way out for him, so why is he just spending that amount of time in there? Yeah, once all the machinery was surrounding him, you know, the machinery of policing, so the, the officers with rifles on roofs and, you know, telescopic sights and all of that, there was simply no way out for him. Mm. Um, and eventually he was getting more and more suicidal. So what they did was they drove up to the back of the van that he was in and fired tear gas through the back windows, trying to incapacitate him to save his life, drag him out, put him in handcuffs and send him back to prison. Mm -hmm. But if you uh, watch the footage, and I think the footage is still available uh, on the internet somewhere, um, you can hear that after the CS gas has been fired into the back of the van, shortly thereafter, there's a dull thud. And that's Bagri putting the shotgun in his mouth and blowing his brains out. Wow. Yeah. It, and that's not the, the desired outcome for the police officers, is it? You always want people to serve their time. You know, I would far prefer it if he'd come out of there alive and had been sent back to prison and had served the punishment for the dreadful crime that he committed. But he took that way out, mm. you know, which, which is irritating. 
I was told I would never fight again. But you did fight again. For a long time. How did that happen? I told a lot of lies. <laughs> I cheated a lot of tests. 